Hi everyone and welcome to the Cybersecurity Sauna. My name is Janne Kauhanen and I will be your sauna majori and the host of this podcast. Thank you for joining us for another session where we sweat out the hot topics in security. Welcome to our all listeners and be sure to follow us on Twitter at Cybersound. Geopolitical conflicts impact many people and organizations that aren't directly involved. And today many of these conflicts play out in cyberspace where it's easy to become collateral damage. So what can we do to protect ourselves in this climate? Or even better, is there a way for us to help resolve these conflicts to make cyberspace a safer place for everyone? Today we're joined by Janne Talas and Johannes Laaksonen from CMI, Martti Ahtisaari Peace Foundation, and Christine Beherasko from WithSecure to talk about how we can navigate this challenge. Thank Thanks. you, Janne. Thank you so much. So we're basically here to talk about cyber conflicts. What do we mean when we say that? What's the definition? I would start defining that there are no cyber conflicts as such. I think there are conflicts in cyberspace. What I mean by that, we are CMI is a conflict management organization, conflict resolution organization. We have a long track record of addressing conflicts. And we are now talking about the conflicts that have happened outside, but now they also happen in cyberspace. It's nothing new, but it's a new area where the conflicts unfold. That's the kind of the main point for us. Okay. Does that make sense? Janne is actually quite right. I mean, cyberspace is really just an extension, a new dimension, if you may, of where conflicts play out. So there have already been geopolitical conflicts even in the past, and now we have a new dimension to protect and where people engage. I think in addition to the the definition of, of cyber conflict, I think it's important to get to the bottom of what is cyber warfare and the differences there, because what we do a lot at CMI is we do analysis. We try to understand the causes of conflicts, the different actors uh, within those conflicts and how different tools are used within conflict and within war. From that perspective, a cyber war and cyber conflict are actually a different things. This is a very good point being raised by Johannes, because I mean, when it comes to what happens with cyber conflict, we see from our technical um, capabilities that there are uh, cyber espionage Mm. and there's like cyber sabotage. And usually the cyber espionage, they, they are not really cyber war. They, they sort of, maybe you can allude to previous um, espionage in the real world or in the physical world uh, when it comes to this espionage where it's really all about just gathering information. And typically once there is a kinetic war or something already happening out there, then cyber sabotage is also a very clear play for these different nation states. I think it's a very good point. I think much of the cyber discussion, all cyber discussions, I have background on the cyber diplomacy, has been so-called under threshold. So there is mm. a threshold of armed conflict, yep. and then the different laws kick in. And then there is a kind of zone, gray zone, that we often say, that is very often used in the cyber situations. And I think this is what we are talking about. And what we have seen in Ukraine is an interesting situation because we have been for, let's say, 10, 15 years, discussed about what are the rules of cyber states can do when it's the peacetime. Mm. But now we're mm. actually kicking for the first time with the war in Ukraine, we are in the wartime situation. And that's something that is kind of a lot to learn. And I think we, kind of legal issues and other issues that, that we have to look. Two additional points that are very important on, on, on that follows from the definition that we have. First of all, that kind of mediation perspective, it is something that we need to do much better with the cyber. Because mm-hmm. as we, as we I agree, that's a new sphere, a new field, a new realm yeah. where the conflicts unfold. That's something that we need to understand and handle better. We are not very good at it. No. And the second point that follows from the observation that we have at a kind of starting point is that you cannot actually resolve cyber conflict separately. Usually the conflict is somewhere that comes from the real life. There is a kind of inequality, dysfunctional political systems that kind of create conflicts. And those conflicts create then a cyber consequence. But what happens in the cyber realm is a consequence. Mm. It's not the kind of the real conflict needs to be addressed somewhere else. And I think that's something you have to do them together. And, and this is really looking at the cyber from very clear conflict perspective. Mm-hmm. That cyber is important, but it's not somewhere that you can actually resolve the very conflict. So yeah. we need, to, we need the, to, in a way, be able to understand the drivers of the conflict, the grievances, exactly. the challenges on the ground and the political struggles in order to be able to, to also get to the bottom of why are these people using these cyber tools in conflict and how do we move forward in terms of resolution. That makes sense to me. For businesses, this is problematic because you can stay out of a traditional war by not being in the war zone, but cyber conflict and all these phenomena can affect companies that are not directly involved with the war effort. 
Do we have some examples of what that collateral damage for businesses looks like, Christine? Well, the thing with cyberspace is that we have built this to be borderless. Mm. And we have built this without geopolitical considerations because, well, it's sort of like a utopia thinking that we are going to be there and collaborating together and then these geopolitical tensions come in. And here we are in this dimension without any borders and we're trying to make borders on top of it. It's very hard to make that work because the, the framework has a hard time supporting that. So we need to build things on top of it that separate things altogether. Now, when it comes to businesses, so the challenge is that all of these businesses are also reaching out for various markets globally and expanding all over the place. And therefore, their reach is quite global, as global as cyberspace. So essentially, it falls down to the businesses now to understand how their supply chain works, who are their suppliers, where are they doing businesses. So one example, one very popular example, was what happened with NotPetya, where, mm. I mean, nobody knew probably a lot of these companies that they were doing business in Ukraine or some of their suppliers doing business in Ukraine. And then it all cascaded downwards and ended up with more than 10 billion US dollars in global collateral damage. So that kind of impact could actually be very real in this type of climate, because you're talking about nation states, which essentially have virtually unlimited budgets to perform cyber attacks. I, I could even go bigger uh, in a way that I think collateral damage is only one mechanism that how the geopolitics affect. I think there are two other mechanisms that directly affect uh, companies. First of all, is regulation is, and it will be even more difficult to have uh, kind of funding from certain countries or kind of intellectual property for certain countries or or even markets could be split up. So clearly there will be regulation, what stuff you can take where and how you get the funding. So I, I think that's something that is coming up. The companies have to react to that. They have to figure that out. The second is really uh, collateral damage that is big as we, as we have seen, um, uh, not Petya. And, and I think there is kind of increasing problems when the attacks are more and more indiscriminate. The third one, and I, I think this is kind of bordering what you said. There are lots of companies who could be part of a supply chain for military effort. Right. Or they could be perceived to be critical parts of infrastructure. It could be finance, it could be transportation, it could be hospitals, and they are in danger. They could be targets. Mm -hmm. And I, I think these three that you have the regulation being targeted as a kind of, as a part of war effort, or then, uh, then you can be collaterally, there could be collateral damage. I would say these three, and I think all the companies should kind of figure out and think and map what is their kind of exposure of this, all, all these three? What about if you're like completely left field? Like no way nobody can think you're a part of any sort of military related supply chain. If you're a company that, for example, operates in a, like a large domestic market like the US, like why should you care about a, a Russian DDoS attack against targets in Ukraine? Could I add to also what Janne said? I think fourthly, there's a fourth element, which is interesting where um, when you see nation state level actors using certain cyber capabilities and tools, against their uh, adversary in a conflict could be that that malware, some of those tools, some of those approaches and tactics will at some point be deployed by also opportunistic criminal parties. So in a sense, it makes tools and techniques available to criminals broader and larger. And those may be used again to target businesses, to target companies. So from that perspective, it's crucial for organizations, for companies to be on top of what's happening in the, in the cyber world, what kinds of tools are being deployed and how to to protect against those. It's also a question about this certain company understanding their customers downstream. They may not be the targets, but their customers may be the targets. So they become sort of like a conduit for targeting their customers. Do they understand enough that who are purchasing their capabilities, who are they installing their software to, who are they serving, that they could be potentially targets? Because essentially, if they protect their organizations, they are protecting their customers. And I, I just picking up uh, Johannes's point, I think it's important also to understand what kind of attacks, what kind of tools, who is the attacker? Because these same tools, what botnet is being used? Because that's something these same tools could be easily used and are likely to be used in US. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think just to be abreast what is happening is crucial because there could be something new. There could be something interesting that emerges from somewhere. And we have seen the speed how the new innovations are kind of adopted mm. in the dark side. So I think it is useful to stay abreast what is happening uh, for, for all the companies uh, around the world, what is really the cutting edge of, of technology. De definitely. I mean, one example is already shadow brokers and the NSA tools. So 
Yep. This has already happened in the past. Case in point. <laughs> yeah. And I think also it's crucial to, or at least a little bit challenge the kind of uh, point where uh, an organization is strictly working in the US and they may have n- no kind of uh, connection to what's happening on the ground in Ukraine, for example, because like was already earlier pointed out, the global is local and vice versa in this cyber world. Mm-hmm. And I think um, when we look at cyber conflicts and cyber war, there's always that element of politics. And if you're a US-based company, the challenge is to to kind of ask whether... You know, are you truly neutral in that that whole equation? And could you potentially be a target from the by the virtue of you know where you're based and and what kinds of customers you serve, et cetera, et cetera? So again, to challenge that point, whether you are actually in the clear, so to speak. Okay, but but you know, let's think about that for a minute. The preparations, like you're you're talking about how the tools are going to be proliferated anyway, and soon the criminals will will be using the same technologies as the nation state attackers. But surely there are differences. Being like, if you're a company, surely it looks a little bit different whether you're being hit by a nation state attacker or a criminal organization, or does it? Does it look exactly the same? It depends on the nation state. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Precisely. yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I think in in general, it could be said that if it's a, a tool for cyber conflict and cyber war, those attackers they tend to have more resources, they tend to be more persistent in their in their efforts, exactly, and they yeah. tend to have uh, a very different motive. So it's mm-hmm. not about just putting a ransomware on your system and, and trying to kind of get that quick Bitcoin, but it's a, it's it's about attacking you as an organization, what you represent, and then repeating that un- until you get through. So it can be a bit more, more disastrous from you, that perspective. Johannes actually makes a very good point on the motive, because I mean, the motive is really what they are targeting within the estate of who they are attacking. But how much is the cost of attacking that organization is also factored in, because even if they're nation state threat actors, if it's so easy to just perform attacks via automated tools to this organization, they don't really need to build like new zero-day vulnerabilities. They can just use existing tools to attack this organization. But of course, if there's something very valuable that they want and the cost of attacking is very high, if the value of what they're aiming for is still higher than the cost of the attack, then they are nation states. They're still going to perform this type of attacks. The, the main the kind of starting point, there is a collusion between the state and the private or kind of criminal actors. That's what we have seen the last few years. It's a fact that it's sometimes difficult to kind of distinguish the kind of who, who is acting. But I think the point what we have made, I think the two points that are important, that the mot- motivation, you clearly see attacks against the targets that they don't provide uh, return on investment mm. <laughs> for the criminals. So you, you need to be kind of quite liquid in order to be attractive. And there are attacks against the kind of organizations that are not liquid. I think that's something. The second thing, and I, I think it, you can, Stina said it, but I said it very kind of frankly, that if you have a state attacker, then your resources are unlimited. So your criminals have a limited resources and they have a priorities, but the state attacker, if it goes somewhere against something, it is really unlimited resources. So they will throw what it takes if they find something. I think these are the big differences. Sometimes you actually see after the attack, it will take a while before you figure out. And I think the motivation and money is very crucial here to detect whether this is a nation state or criminal gang who is attacking. We tend to have that distinction where if we talk about cyber conflict, cyber war, it's going to be there's uh, a nation state actor behind it. And then we talk about the, the smaller criminal group. It's useful to remind ourselves that it's obviously not that black and white in the real world. So we have, you know, nation states could be acting through proxies mm-hmm. and those could be sort of criminal organizations that are tasked to deploy do certain aspects of the cyber warfare. And for those organizations, the criminal purposes and the, and the purposes of cyber conflict, mm-hmm. they may kind of mix with one another. Mm-hmm. So I think that's useful to keep in mind. Because I think Johannes's point is very good. This kind of collusion and, you know, having technology transfers from private to or the public to private. It's interesting now in the context of war. Now we are above threshold. My sense is that we are not clear what are the rules in the situation of war. When you have a war case, what states can do and what they cannot do with the private mm. partners. Fair enough. I do want to talk about one point about the sort of the asymmetry. We're talking about nation state attackers, whether through criminal collusion or through their own resources, unlimited budgets, very motivated, very persistent and their targets might be organizations like a news outlet covering the war or a crisis mitigation organization or a humanitarian organization. Like these are not for profit organizations who have significantly limited resources. 
have they lost the game already? Is there anything they can do? I think it's a challenge. And I think what's in sort of behind and what's in the background of this whole reality is that we think about cyber war and the different victims to attacks that may be there. To me, there's two kinds of organizations. In a sense, there's the, the one organization that deals in classified in government information or works in critical infrastructure or is a juicy target from that perspective to a hostile uh, adversary. And then there's the second category, which includes, I think, the organizations that you mentioned, humanitarian actors, media outlets, etc. Et and the reason why I lump them together is that they all in a way represent certain aspect of the kind of ideology of, of a democratic society. So right. you have media, humanitarian aspects, uh, development organizations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, I want to emphasize that the reason why those are useful targets is because they represent something that the adversary may want to harm in order to make a point or for, for other reasons. And your question was that whether the fight is already lost, I don't think so. I think there's a lot that we can do through developing our own capacity, supporting other smaller organizations in de developing their capacity, building networks to challenge problems and find solutions together, seek partnerships with organizations such as with Secure and others to get ahead of the curve. So I don't, I'm not that pessimistic, but it's a challenge and I think uh, the resources are always uh, scarce. And the, that's actually a, a pretty good point that I don't believe that we have lost because we haven't even fought back that much yet. Because um, like, from, where is the situation coming from? We, we are sort of like just starting now with organizations uh, that, for example, like um, CMI. But um, for example, like Cyberpeace as well, that these are organizations who are trying to be um, sort of like the central point that helps nonprofits and uh, journalists and various organizations who don't have the resources or capacity to help themselves. And these organizations didn't really exist like more than five years ago. There's very, there's very little support for this. So I would dare say that this is only going to get better, mm -hmm. like from here onwards. I, I was happy to, I was listening very carefully, Johannes, because Johannes is the CMI's point man for these <laughs> yes. issues. That he, had he been uh, negative, I have been, uh, I've been worried. So I, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> we, we have a chance. We have a chance. No, I think the, the reality, we have a real challenge, a big problem. The news we have had, humanitarian agencies have been hacked. I have colleagues who have NSO Pegasus flying to yeah. their phone. Yeah. So this is the reality. So the organizations like, like us are increasingly targeted. That's a fact. Uh, what can we do? We have started to do, I think there are several things. One thing what Johannes said is just, we need to partner with companies. We, we cannot do it alone. We really need to, to work together with the, with the companies who are experts on this. And I, that's what we have, for example, CMI, we have partnered with, with Secure. Because we really need help on this. And I think it covers all the organizations. So that's we need to push. But at the same time, we have also, as a CMI, we have thought that it's, it's important to work with other international organizations. We, uh, we have worked with the cyber toolbox on, on kind of hygiene uh, course for the UN folks who are dealing with the, uh, with the mediation issues. Mm. So there are things, quite simple things you can do, small things. Uh, but I think you have to be aware first. And there hasn't been enough awareness. Part of this podcast is really to, to really increase the awareness that we really, this is an issue that we have to tackle and we need help from uh, companies. But I think we will never be 100%. I was glad to hear when you said that there are simple things, practical things we can do. Let's talk about that a little bit. Like, you know, let's say you're a, a small organization and for whatever reason, your threat model now includes nation state attacks from, I don't know, Russia or China or the US. What do you do? I think that a lot will depend on, on where you're starting at, the level or the position where you're starting at. And I think that the whole threat modeling, asset risk assessment phase, I think the importance of that cannot be understated. I think it's crucial for, for every organization to, to understand what the context of where they're working, the kinds of information that they possess and they, they process in their work and sort of the dependencies that they have to, to other organizations. And I think that the key aspect to that assessment is to understand your own role. When I was previously talking about, say, media organizations, they embody the kind of idea of, of free media, which, which may make them kind of a useful target for, for cyber attacks. I think all organizations need to do something quite similar. They need to understand where they fit in in this equation. So we as a CMI, we do that assessment. We try to understand where we fit in. And based on that assessment, we start coming up with risks and we start coming up with, with kind of an understanding of how our system looks uh, in, in the given situation. And then we look at our resources and look at what we do internally. And if we feel that we're unable to manage those, then we reach out to companies, then we reach out to network and, and we start slowly from there. But it starts with the assessment in terms of how I see it. And Johannes makes a pretty good point with the risks because how I see it actually per organization, I mean, every organization has a goal. 
And they usually have several outcomes that they want to accomplish. So whether it's helping journalists on field or supporting certain minorities, uh, for instance, so for nonprofits. And with these outcomes comes risks. Like what are the risks to these outcomes not manifesting as they should? And behind those risks would then be the assets that these organizations have. And when we're now talking about the assets, then these are the things that are very interesting to nation state threat actors. What are those that they can actually try to acquire and then figure out like what are the threats towards these assets? So for me, it's sort of like a staged way of looking at it from the outcomes that the organization is trying to accomplish all the way to the threats, to the assets that support those outcomes. And I've also found that it's quite difficult to come up with the the mitigations and the control measures for you do the risk assessment. And you'd be surprised how many smaller organizations there are who haven't necessarily even conducted a proper risk assessment on their cyber and their information security setup. So I agree. I think it starts from there. It starts from a proper risk assessment and coming up with the controls from, that's from a, those. That's a nice way of yeah. preempting where I'm <laughs> trying to take this conversation. I'm really trying to get you guys to commit to some like practical <laughs> examples of like how does a company protect themselves from falling collateral damage to these uh, attacks? Like what can you do? Like sure, risk assessment. But then again, isn't that basic cyber hygiene? Haven't yeah. we been saying that for the last 20 years? Like what can you do now? For example, if this is an organization that uses open source code to include in their software, whether that's an application hosted in the cloud or that's something that's installed in somebody's endpoint, once you use open source code, the people who are modifying that code, you don't really know like who those are. There are many contributors in those areas, and we have already seen that that's actually an easy bar to get into when it comes to supply chain attacks. Mm. So there are basic hygiene, for example, like a SAST or DAST that could be used. So use tools that are already out there that they just elevate or raise the bar for security for your organization, especially if you're pushing out something that others are using, because that, that's the perfect way to push in all of the supply chain attacks to your customers downstream. Mm. And I think also in the modern era, I think the digitalization of organizational processes of work, it's already underway. And that means that re, sort of resourcing into IT putting resources into information security, I think that should be a priority because many of the things that Janne also mentioned about knowing your risks and training people and understanding what are the tools that you use and what vulnerabilities are there, none of that happens, I think, magically and by itself. So it's taking that stance in a way that now we're going to invest in, in information security and that's going to be potentially at the cost of something else. It's a worthy trade-off anyway. And that may be scary because it sounds like budget, but the truth is, as Janne mentioned as well earlier, this could be a matter of partnership yeah. because mm -hmm. you can partner with organizations who actually have the skill sets who can do this for you. You don't always have to do that yourself or staff it in-house. The biggest argument I've heard in my life against doing the, the cyber hygiene things is that, well, we're not a target. We're not an interesting enough company, things like that. So do you now think that categorically in today's cyber geopolitical situation, those days are past? Everyone's a target. I completely agree. You take a huge risk, no gain. So I think it's just no-brainer. You you have to assume that you could be a target, and then you have to prepare. Mm. So you guys are from an organization that basically does crisis management, tries to mitigate the the tensions of international crises. I know a lot of people, a lot of individuals, and probably organizations as well, are frustrated and feeling powerless about situations like the war in Ukraine. Is there anything? organizations can do to sort of be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem? Like what can people and organizations do to help resolve it mm -hmm. and not just watch as bad stuff happens? Can I, I'll, I'll, I'll open this up because we have been discussing a lot of threats and what, what could go wrong. I think the first point is that always that the digital world, the cyber world gives great opportunities for peacemaking for humankind. So I think while we are talking about the threats and dangers that are lurking there, I would really like to emphasize that this is something that it just gives so big possibilities to reach out people, to make kind of mediation processes more meaningful in many ways, collect data, to use data for these processes. So the possibilities it opens are so big that it's worth the risk. I am positive that in the next 10 years, we will see breakthroughs in how we will mediate and the digital aspects are coming into play. 
And I think that's why I am class half full type of guy. But I want to really put that on the table because we have discussed about the risk. And the second thing is that really the partnership. Kind of mediation world, we are not used to working with companies. I'm very frank. We are used to work with the states and international organizations and guerrilla groups and all that. But the kind of cyber world only exists because of the private actors who maintain it. So this is an area we have to work with you guys. Uh, there is no other way. And that requires a little bit of skill from our side, but I think it's coming. This kind of partnerships and ideas, discussions what we're having here. I believe one thing to add to what Yane has mentioned is for organizations to also understand that when they say cyberspace, the moment their organization is connected there, they are part of that cyberspace. They can't say that they're going to cyberspace. Their connectivity, their estate is part of that cyberspace. And therefore, if they want to be responsible citizens of this area, they would need to be part of the solution by also securing their area of the cyberspace. Because if more and more different organizations that are part of this whole big fabric actually secure their individual areas, the whole space will eventually come safer for all of us. Yeah, that's it. There's no sort of sovereign national territory in the cyberspace. Every computer out there is owned by an organization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to protect Finland or the US or the UK, you're protecting individual organizations. Mm -hmm. I think in addition to securing your the environment that you have control over, your computers and your networks, I think that's, a, that's where it starts. And I think there's a way to link that into what Janne said, which is that we've talked about the negative aspects of cyber in terms of conflict and in terms of war. But Janne was alluding to the fact that they also bring solutions to the process. There's a way to use technology so that it, they bring people together and they help potentially solve a lot of the issues that we see in, in, in the conflict environments. So I think that's another aspect where potentially organizations could support. They could think in terms of how they can use the technologies that they have to bring people together and create mutual understanding. And I think that they, that would be a fantastic starting point for, like you said uh, in the question, to kind of make the world a better place instead of being hopeless. You got to be fascinated about this. Like, yeah, we have been talking about all these cyber threats, but in your work as crisis management people, like, has the internet changed that? Like, do you feel that, you know, what you're doing right now, is it different from what it would have been 20, 30 years ago? I think it is. Uh, it is interesting you do teams negotiations. I, uh, my, with my the guerrilla organizations. Uh, no, no, not, not quite. <laughs> I, I, I haven't done it. I haven't. I, I did. I, I was in diplomacy before, and I did the international conference. I guess I did one of the first big international conferences, the Afghanistan 2020, uh, right. the pledging mm -hmm. conference in Afghanistan. It was like a running a studio like this, as it was during the COVID time. So I learned a lot. It was interesting experience. There were some upsides and there are some limitations. Things do change, and what I what I think where I I think we have the biggest upside, real uh, possibilities with the digital uh, digital means is really the digital inclusion. I, I guess that is the low hanging fruit. I mean that millions, uh, billions of people around this globe don't have a voice politically, and digital means could actually give them voice, could bring them in the dialogue meetings and so forth. So that's something, for example, we think. Is there something we could do to tap to this untapped resource of, of voiceless people around the world? And that's something. Or the data. We collect data on our consultations and the work. Could that be used? So I think there are, there are possibilities. I think, in a way, linking back to the negative discussions that we have discussed, I think the criminals and, and the kind of the malicious actors have been much better in using technology. Now it's our turn, the good guys, try to up our game and really to try to use the technology for, for, for the good. And I think there are possibilities for that. I think the technology is in a way a two-edged uh, sword from the perspective of, of the work that we do at CMI. On the other hand, when COVID happened and we started negotiating with the guerrillas, so to speak, over teams, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we realized that there are certain things that we can do much easier, which would be mm -hmm. engaging with women, for example, mm -hmm. uh, allowing them to be part of negotiations with young people, yes. people who would have been otherwise, uh, for them it would have been difficult to, to move to a physical uh, dialogue or negotiation uh, meeting. So those, in yeah. from that perspective, it was it was better. But then on the other hand, we kind of create this blind spot where we potentially uh, um, forget that there are still a huge amount of people who don't have access to internet, who don't have access to technology. So we need to be mindful of that in all the kind of excitement that we have over over new technologies that we don't want to be, you know, leaving important people out. I I wonder if um, once 5G and satellite internet sort of like proliferates globally mm -hmm. and more and more people in these billions that don't have a voice today, once they come online, 
if we will have something more equitable. But of course, there will be more bad players as well because. Yeah, yeah. But and, and this is the reality already in Afghanistan or in Mali. Young people do have their smartphones. People are connected mm. in many places. That this is something what we in Europe sometimes don't realize that that is happening globally. There are more and more devices that are connected, and people know what is going on, and that's. That really shapes uh, the business, but it shapes also the conflicts and how the conflicts can be resolved. And I think this is really the, this is where we are together with the, uh, with, with kind of, with secure guys and figuring out the new world that this is happening. Indeed. And part of that new world, obviously, is also the risks, which we have, have discussed. But I think I want to go back to the sort of the physical security side of things. And I remember when uh, a few years back, or let's say f five years back in this field, when we met with security professionals, it was mm -hmm. all about kind of the, um, uh, the, the, the physical security of, of humanitarian work and of development work. And the fact that through neutrality and through kind of being there in order to help people, we would, you know, that posture would already kind of mitigate a lot of the risk because nobody would want to harm those who are, you know, there to as, as neutral third parties to help people. And that was, you know, obviously at some point we realized that that doesn't, uh, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> and that was, uh, you know, uh, let's say political actors, um, guer guerrilla groups and, and militant groups, they would attack humanitarian targets in order just to, ma to make a statement. They would potentially see a humanitarian mm -hmm. organization as, as an extension of colonialism or whatever the excuse would be, and, and they would be attacked. And I don't see there being any difference when we go into this new world, when we are more and more reliant on technology. It only sort of lowers the bar for these kinds of actors to target humanitarian organizations and make that same statement uh, through different means. So again, having those networks and having these kinds of uh, partnerships with companies, I think is crucial because that protects everyone. I only see the, the risk landscape becoming more complicated in the future. That makes perfect sense to me. I want to thank you guys for being with us today and then talking through this uh, conflict issue. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for having us, Janne. That was the show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Please get in touch with us through Twitter with the hashtag CyberSauna with your feedback, comments and ideas. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe.